Greetings and welcome to the Center for South Asia at Stanford University. I'm Anna Bigelow. I'm the current director of the center and um, faculty in religious studies at Stanford. I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native people. And then for our event today, I am beyond delighted to welcome back to the center um, my colleague and friend, Jisha Menon, who is a scholar of post-colonial theory and performance studies. As my predecessor in this job and having directed brilliantly the CSA for several years, she has now moved onwards and upwards as director of global studies. So we're really excited to welcome her back to the, to the Center for South Asia. Jisha's first book, The Performance of Nationalism, India, Pakistan, and the Me Memory of Partition, examined the effective and performative dimensions of nation making. And now she's the author of Brutal Beauty, Aesthetics and Aspiration in Urban India from Northwestern University Press just last year. This work considers the city and the self as aesthetic projects that are renovated in the wake of neoliberal economic reforms in India. And in the book, she interrogates concepts of nostalgia and liberalism through art practices and performances that reflect, challenge, or remake the urban imaginary in times of precarity. It's beautifully written and incredibly thought-provoking, so I am really delighted to welcome my colleague and friend, Jisha Menon, back to CSA. And we will follow her comments with um, some comments from two other dear colleagues, uh, Usha Ayer and Samar al Sabr, and I will introduce them before their words. So welcome, Jisha. Thank you, Anna. Thanks so much for hosting this event. Uh, I'm really grateful to you and to Lalita and Simrat and to CSA for inviting me to uh, talk about my book today and for inviting this wonderful panel uh, to discuss it with me. Um, I'm really grateful to the larger CSA community as well of uh, colleagues, students and affiliates who've provided an incredibly warm and welcoming home for so many of us here at Stanford and beyond now in these pandemic times through Zoom. Um, and thanks to everyone who's attending. I see a lot of my friends here, a lot of colleagues and my students. Um, and I know there's a lot going on for so many of you. And uh, I'm especially grateful that you took the time to spend with me in my book today. Um, and I'm beyond grateful to Usha and Samar for agreeing to serve as discussants. Mm -hmm. It's such an honor for me to be in conversation with these two uh, brilliant colleagues. So thank you. So the book, um, I, I thought maybe I'll start by talking about the genesis of the project itself, which emerged from um, a theater production that I had done uh, of Cherry Orchard um, that I directed in 2008. My friend and colleague Abhishek Majumdar, who's a director and playwright in Bangalore, and I adapted Chekhov's Cherry Orchard. Um, and we thought that the, um, the play kind of captures that moment of um, social transition from feudal landed aristocracy to a more robust bourgeoisie in uh, turn of century Russia. And through the play, uh, we were hoping to raise questions about imminent ecological concerns and the radically changing configurations of social identity and power in the city of Bangalore. But why did I want to make a show about this? Because uh, Bangalore was such a changed city in ways that really impacted its people very deeply. Post-liberalization in 1991, when India embraced economic reforms, there were massive efforts to kind of remake the city into a destination for high-tech industries. Bangalore, which is a city in Southern Karnataka, which is you know, often referred to um, using terms such as the garden city and pensioner's paradise, it kind of evokes these images of rest and retreat from the frenzy of um, life's work now was growing at a pace that was so rapid that uh, you know you could sense the kind of increased velocity of transnational traffic in capital and media information commodities that had dramatically transformed this city in uh, in Karnataka so the book kind of traces the material social psychic effects of this transformation by looking at artworks that draw our attention to the proliferating social implications of world-class city projects. 
Um, at its heart, Brutal Beauty argues that neoliberalism is an aesthetic project and is felt really deeply through our changed affective, psychic, and social relations. The book invokes the neoliberal not only as the historical launch of economic reforms in 1991, when the Indian government opened its doors to foreign trade and investment, deregulation, privatization, tax reforms, et cetera, which sort of uh, transformed the economy from a developmental state to a more capitalist economy. Uh, it explores the neoliberal not only as reduction of social programs or the rearticulation of state and market dynamics, but also as a calculus, as a, as a market calculus that saturates all aspects of social life. And it argues that uh, the neoliberal uh, involves more than just an analytical category of political economy. It's, it's an aesthetic project because it allows us uh, to attend to these centrist transformations in the physical environment of the changed city. But it's not only the citizen, uh, the, the city that becomes the object of aesthetic reimagining, but also the citizens, because citizens are also in the process of remaking themselves to change, uh, to suit their changed environments. Um, so the book explores how our discourses of beauty mobilized in ways that can have quite anti-democratic effects. For example, in the case of beautification programs in the city. And it also points out to the uh, aesthetic refashioning of urban citizens who are uh, also kind of you know, reshaping themselves to correspond to their newly uh, changed environment. And it explores how discourses of relentless self-enhancement produce attrition and burnout of workers. And it argues that the city exceeds the lens of planning and policy discourses within urban studies. We need to centrally look at the city as an affective space. And Artworks allow us to capture the affects that are kind of swirling in these cities and think about it as a really central and key player. So the question of aesthetics provides a, a really helpful lens for me to understand these spatial aspirations of politicians, real estate entrepreneurs, uh, urban planners, as the city kind of enlarges and morphs, it absorbs these peri-urban territories and reconfigures the spatial contours and social dynamics of urban neighborhoods. And then these spatial transformations impact mobility and livelihoods of the citizens. It regulates people's social, professional, personal lives. Uh, and these uh, spatial arrangements um, you know, also demarcate the wealthy from the urban poor. You have informal settlements where the urban poor um, form a steady pool of service and labor um, that enfold really uh, around these kind of gated communities or islands of affluence, where you have strict surveillance rules um, that monitor the coming and goings of um, workers who come in and go through these spaces. And the discourse of beauty becomes a key way to rationalize measures that make its more unsightly elements uh, invisible. So the chapters are organized around these urban transformations and key affects that are produced in the wake of these uh, cultural economic transformations. The first chapter I start off by looking at panic in relation to questions of property, real estate and precarity. I look at urban panic as a kind of heightened emotional response to the re-territorialization of space and the frenzy of construction and building projects that are currently underway in Bangalore. And I look at it through the lens of various artworks. Um, these numerous kind of building projects manifest the kind of frenzy of development in the city. And I ask, how do these material and spatial manifestations of urban aspiration produce panic as a kind of affective experience of territorial disposition? And the artists that I consider uh, examine panic from multiple viewpoints, uh, the insulation of elite enclaves and gated communities from slum dwellings, the precarious homes of migrant laborers, the pervasive sense of exile for religious minorities in India. And I think about how uh, panic is spatialized, managed, exacerbated, or overcome through spatial configurations. 
But the book also uh, delves into questions of how aesthetics are crucial to the constitution of new aspirational subject positions through new modes of uh, sensorial address, new patterns of behavior. Uh, how is subjectivity uh, shaped to suit the demands of a newly emerging capitalist society? And I explored this in my uh, discussion of the call center industry where performance becomes both a form of um, aesthetic and emotional labor, but also as the yardstick through which employees are supervised, evaluated, remunerated. The call center employee takes on new corporeal and sartorial practices to kind of um, inhabit a sense of globality, even as she's sitting in her cubicle and talking to a customer uh, across the globe. So the corporate demands to reshape the social and cultural syntax of employees takes on a variety of forms, which includes training modules in accent neutralization, as well as insidiously conforming tastes and desires to create new patterns of consumption. Um, so I ask, how do the virtual intimacies that are generated by new media and market technologies ushering in aspirations uh, toward a new cosmopolitan subjectivity? And by invoking cosmopolitanism, I uh, consider its deep in entrenchment in circuits of capital. So considering call center agents and the actors who portray them within the films and uh, performances that I look at, uh, I think of them as exemplary cosmopolitan subjects and examine the labor of impersonation that's central to the call center industry um, in their aspiration to perform uh, these new roles within the transnational economy. So the liberalization of the economy, the global flows of media, commodities, capital, images, et cetera, precipitate a kind of proliferating range of urban desires and aspirations. Um, and I turn to the circulation of non-normative uh, desires in the larger context of globalizing media, NGO activism, and its intersection with existing caste and trans identities in urban media. How do these new urban subjects emerge from the shadows of shame and stigma to defiantly aspire to different modes of desiring? Uh, these very disruptions in the social fabric enable non-normative desiring subjects to assert new forms of pleasure in the public sphere. The emergent political rationality so not only ruptures existing systems of social and political life, it also has a productive force. And I think that's important to underline because it gives rise to these new uh, publics, new subjects, new worlds. Um, so the very forces that can habituate a subject to new modes of being can also produce new sources of understanding and even resistance. The narratives of the city in decline or death of the city are unable to make sense of that contradictory generative force. So I consider the role of performance in the formation of an aspirational selfhood uh, by examining these artworks that explore the role of the high-tech worker, the homeowner, the queer activist. Uh, and then I turn to questions of narcissism in the context of the obsessive curation and presentation of self in social media and state and corporate incitements to self-reliance in public discourses. And I ask in an environment that sort of routinely indoctrinates self-empowerment and personal responsibility, into citizen consumers, how might a counterintuitive reading of narcissism illustrate the unmaking of the self? Um, in contrast to principles of performance, striving, and productivity, narcissist represents a world of self-absorption and indulgence. So how may a subject resist these forces that urge a sense of uh, Promethean striving? What may a politics of refusal to the incessant entrepreneurialism of the self look like? So um, the book illustrates that narcissism develops not only as an emergent culture of self-absorption, but also as a kind of libidinal intervention in a, an environment that's increasingly organized around the, the performance principle. Um, and then it concludes uh, its analysis by looking at spent objects of urban desire, that's trash. 
it turns to questions of obsolescence, obsolescence of objects as well as of people, and it explores artistic engagements with obsolescence to examine the systematized human degradation that becomes part of the market value of the uh, market calculus of value and waste. And it asks what are the human, social, ecological consequences of the current valorization of innovation, speed, and enhancement? How do we understand the pervasiveness of obsolescence, the feeling of fastness, of having outlived one's utility in cultures that celebrate youth and newness? And the artworks I look at here examine the porous borders between persons and things and allows us to see obsolescence not only of commodities that are marked as waste, but also of people who are considered to have outlived their value and utility. So to wrap up, the book chronicles these themes of urban aspiration and the incitement to aestheticize the self in the city. And in doing so, it urges us to attend to the aesthetic dimensions of neoliberalism. It eludes, uh, it, it el elucidates how urban um, aesthetics uh, reshape the self and the city and unleash forces in overt and insidious ways. They repress democratic multitudes that are teeming within the city, deemed unsightly and unwanted. Excuse me. Zoom fun. Um, they goad us to desire, accumulate, and discard objects and identities that perpetuate uh, social norms of capitalist and fastest re regimes. They entice us to live in ways that actively reinforce fantasies of an imagined elsewhere, while some, uh, simultaneously wearing us down under the relentless pressures of contemporary work cultures. Um, they orient us toward elusive and enigmatic futural horizons, even as we enervate our social environment and our material environment. The psychic and social attrition that's produced by this systemic precarity leaves us ever more restless and exhausted, guarded and suspicious. Yet the artists in this book reveal to us these new urban forms also generate contradictory and unpredictable effects. They produce new forms of desire, new modes of solidarities and new sources of pleasure. And I think I'll stop there and hand things over back to you all. Thank you so much for that provocative and evocative introduction to the work. Um, and hopefully it will inspire many to uh, pick up this fantastic work. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody that we're gonna, we will have a time for some Q&A and that there is a button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit a question. Um, but we also have two distinguished guests here today to introduce our conversation and to begin with some uh, engagements with Jisha's work. So our first guest is Usha Iyer, who's Assistant Professor of Film Studies in the Department of Art History. Their research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of cinema, performance, and gender and sexuality studies. Usha is the author of the recently published Dancing Women, Choreographing Corporeal Histories of Hindi Cinema, which examines constructions of gender, stardom, sexuality, and spectacle in Hindi cinema through women's labor, collaborative networks, and gestural genealogies to produce a corporeal history of South Asian cultural modernities. Usha's current book project explores affective engagements of Caribbean spectators with Indian cinema. And I welcome Usha to our conversation. Thank you so much, Anna. It's such a delight to be here with, like Anna said, many colleagues and friends. Um, uh, it, hi, Jisha, <laughs> and hi, everyone who is here today. Um, it really is such a pleasure and an honor to be here engaging with Jisha on her fabulous second book, Brutal Beauty. That title is just amazing, um, Aesthetics and Aspiration in Urban India. Um, given that I, like so many others, haven't been able to travel to India during the past two years, it was both moving and joy giving to engage so deeply through this book with the changes wrought in the city of Bangalore or Bengaluru as it's been renamed. I've visited Bangalore often, uh, both pre and post liberalization and witnessed as a visitor, the transformations that the book traces. But Brutal Beauty invited me equally to transpose its insights to other Indian cities 
um, that I've lived in in India, including Pune, Hyderabad, Bombay, and Delhi. Without flattening differences and local histories in each of these locations. So the book is also very specifically about Bangalore. Indeed, it's one of the book's strengths that it the one of the book's strengths lies in its close attention to the specificities of the city of Bangalore, which in turn opens up an ambitious and rich engagement with questions of the global and the local the shifting contours of post-colonial versus quote-unquote global cities, world-class cities, um, and the deep extractive imbrications between the global north and the south. Um, and so through, the, through this examination of the city, it opens up these a host of other questions. And so I'm really hoping there will be discussions of the book, not just in Bangalore, which I would love to attend via Zoom, um, but also in cities like Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mexico City. Um, it really opens up a, a, a comparative framework. It kind of begs a comparative framework to study kind of discussions of the global North and South through this lens of urban transformation. Given my own location in film studies, I'm familiar with the significant body of scholarship on the cinematic city, which has been central for discussions of modernity and cinema's participation in the production of new sensations, of speed, thrill, of flannery, as well as related anxieties. And also within film studies, there's been a lot of discussion in post-colonial contexts of the production of what has been called the national modern through the city versus village binary. So studies of Indian cinema, for example, will trace that the, the kind of constant pull and push between the city and the village across the many decades of post-independence um, nation building. In the post-economic liberalization context that Brutal Beauty investigates, however, this cartography and its imagination has altered significantly as the Indian city has witnessed enormous transformations. We now have ever expanding cities with their sometimes semi-urban outer suburbs or multiple satellite cities. So that Bangalore, like most Indian cities, and indeed other urban nodes in the global south, swirls with the affects and infrastructures of metropole and province, of city, small town, and village. And what Jisha calls the heterotemporal intimacy of urban and rural was sharply actually brought into focus during the forced exodus of migrant workers in the first wave COVID lockdown of, in India in 2020, providing the kind of movement that we also images of um, provided a brutal prognosis of the organization of spaces and bodies according to the logics of neoliberal capitalism. Um, so who is dispensable? Um, who has to be, who has to go away? What remains visible in our accounts, in our continued accounts of the pandemic, et cetera. All of this is the purview of brutal beauty, but it approaches urban transformation through the very generative lens of aspiration and aesthetics. Each chapter moves through and across artworks, conceptual explorations of affect and the political economy of urban development. Like the viewer in many of the artworks discussed in the book who has to bend, stretch, crawl, et cetera, in relation to the artwork, to its what are called choreographies of viewing, the book moves nimbly, navigating multiple inhabitations of the city and of academic disciplines involved in the studies of cities and of art. Um, so I'm really kind of envious of how the book moves so nimbly through these various disciplines of art history, performance studies, urban studies, and affect studies. And I think we have in the audience people who engage with many of these disciplines. What I find most remarkable is how carefully the book attends to the many complex interactions between the economic and the aesthetic. These are really complex categories. Um, and the book does not relate them in any kind of simple relation of mirroring or resisting, of complicity or subversion. But as Jisha says, these artworks neither transcend nor subvert market forces. Rather, they call our attention to the agonistic encounter between capital and culture. 
And the book gives us a nuanced and careful account of how emergent capitalist forms are inhabited, negotiated, and contested. And all of us are involved in these inhabitations and daily negotiations and contestations. So I think it really made me think about um, my own position as an academic in a department of art and art history, uh, but also as an urban metropolitan Indian in um, kind of some in a place that's between a small town and urban um, North Californian location. Um, indeed, rather than read art and late capitalism through an oppression versus resistance diet, brutal beauty is keenly attuned to unruly and paradoxical affects and effects and turns to artworks that give complex aesthetic form to social confusions and transformations. Each chapter is filled with careful detailed reading of sculpture, painting, installation, art, plays, photo plays, and films that capture layered histories of the city and new aspirations and their discontents. I was struck by how Jisha's reading of artworks is keenly sensitive to spectatorial positioning and comportment. How do we move through the work and how does that relate to our movement through the city? Just as many of the artworks discussed in the book rescale the viewer, making them feel very large or small, the arraying of these artworks alongside the logics of neoliberal globalization rescales the relationship of aesthetics to political economic changes. So that the aesthetic is not seen as a secondary kind of manifestation, but as something that's happening parallelly and has to be read very carefully. Um, and this has to do also with disciplinary hierarchies uh, of what is considered uh, a more kind of serious engagement with political economic changes. So the book is kind of making big claims and interventions in all of these questions. Brutal beauty's central argument, as you just heard from Jisha, is uh, that neoliberalism is an aesthetic project, not just an economic, social, and political phen phenomenon. Discourses of quote unquote world class cities demand quote unquote global citizens, so that urban aspiration becomes an incitement to aestheticize the self and the city. Whether it's the call center worker, the returning NRIs or non uh, resident Indians, who are many of whom have returned to India and in inhabit Venetian style villas in gated communities, or elite queer subjectivities. And I hope we'll have time in the QA to discuss the chapter on queerness and its relationship to neoliberalism as well. Jisha's turn to aesthetics as a complex terrain is an important one and reminds me of Sylvia Winter asking in her essay, Rethinking Aesthetics, Notes Towards a Deciphering Practice. Um, these are questions that Sylvia Winter poses that for me um, interact very interestingly with Jisha's um, questions and brutal beauty. Winter asks, what does aesthetics do? What is its function in human life? What specifically is its function in our present form of life? What correlation does it bear with the social effectivities of our present order, including that into which the real life citizens and captive populations of US inner cities and third world shantytown archipelagos are locked? She makes that relationship between global north and south that uh, Brutal Beauty is making as well. And Winter asks, what correlation therefore is there with the non-linear structuring dynamics of our present global order, as well as of its nation state subunits? And she's writing in an earlier moment of globalization. So brutal beauty is a great way to connect with these questions that Winter is posing in rethinking aesthetics. Indeed, the title of Jisha's book, Brutal Beauty, captures the many tensions at work here that she puts to such productive interrogation. The brutality of urban beautification programs, for instance, point, points to new urban aesthetics that unleash brutal forces, wanting to invisibilize what is, what is judged to be unsightly and unwanted. Beauty can be brutal and brutalize those laboring to effect these visions of urban beautification. In opposition to this, what Jisha calls aesthetic governmentality. However, the book asserts also that the brutality of neoliberalism can generate unexpected aesthetic responses, that we don't have to jettison beauty, but may find it instead in used tar drums, in e-waste like computer keyboards growing ragi millet, among the many examples in the book. 
And that the question of beauty, of aesthetic appreciation of the quote unquote sublime is rendered a very complicated affective experience. There is thus the brutality of the refashioning of urban citizens, but also the beauty of dissenting art making. Indeed, the brutality, indeed, discourses of beauty, nostalgia, environmental concerns are carefully problematized. And what is foregrounded are the changing contested relationships of culture, class, and caste, whether in the discussion of call center workers, transgender performers, or the relationship of waste and touch in that beautiful fifth chapter. I'm running out of time, but I'd be remiss to not comment on the book's just beautiful parsing of affects ranging across aspiration and precarity, shame and pride, panic, exhaustion and depletion. There are so many passages I'd marked out to read, um, but I invite you to turn to the book to, to kind of look at its really careful parsing of affects. Um, and I'll conclude with just some final remarks and questions that we may or may not have time to turn to. Um, I wanted to say, I so appreciated the critique that is shot through as well with love. Um, Bell Hooks, who recently passed said, she believed criticism comes from a place of love. And what is palpable through brutal beauty is Jisha's love of and familiarity with Bangalore and her particular relationship to it. And it made me think as well of other sites of late capitalist urbanization that we have discussed in our personal conversations, the Gulf, for example, where Jisha spent many years growing up, um, or Silicon Valley, where she studied and where we work now. And I wanted to kind of uh, conclude by thinking about Palo Alto alongside Bangalore. Um, and how the book made me think about these other sites of late capitalist urbanization. It prompted me to think of the many connections, personal and economic, between Bangalore, which is referred to as the Silicon Valley of India, and where we are now, the, the original quote-unquote Silicon Valley. Uh, it, brutal beauty makes us think of the many movements between these two locations, movements of technologies, capital, capital, waste, and laboring bodies, of the offshoring of soft services through, hard, through call centers and other, uh, other kinds of services, and hard services of e-waste dumping, uh, or what she calls the transnational life of e-waste. It makes us think of toxic colonialism and the differential impact of climate change. It makes us think about the invisibilizing of workers in our offices and institutions right here, including in this institution, the continuing redlining logics of urban planning that evacuates one town of the poor and moves them to a neighboring town, uh, East Palo Alto in our case. The invisible poverty in our midst is so much like the gated communities in Bangalore. Um, so that the book forces us to think about the locations we each inhabit and the organization of spaces and bodies and labor within these. Um, and I'll conclude with a line from the book. Um, Jisha says, to rethink hegemonic frameworks for global encounters, we need to move beyond entrenched conceptual binaries of East-West, first world and third world to dispersed mappings of the first world and the third world and vice versa, of rhizomatic shifts in the volatile fields of power and desire. I'll stop here and uh, hand it back to Anna, and we can come back to many other questions I have uh, in the discussion. Thank you. That was fantastic, Usha. And I love the, the bell hooksian idea of critique shot through with love. It reminds me of um, Cornell West's idea of justice is what love looks like in public. So. Um, here we go. So our final guest is Samar al Sabur, who's Assistant Professor of Theater and Performance Studies and affiliated with the Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity and the Embassy Program in Islamic Studies at Stanford here. His recent scholarship focuses on Palestinian theater in Jerusalem, and he's the co-editor of an anthology, Stories Under Occupation and Other Plays from Palestine, which is forthcoming from Siegel Press. And also forthcoming is his collection of the plays of Jackie Lubeck, which is called Youth Plays from Gaza. And that is coming from Bloomsbury. So look out for those. And we will also anticipate his current book project, which is titled Permission to Perform, Palestinian Theater in Jerusalem. So welcome, Samar. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is really a great honor to be here engaging with my dear colleague, Jisha Menon, on her new book which I absolutely found enthralling to read and intellectually stimulating in ways I have not experienced in a long time. 
Um, today, uh, I will speak directly to our audience and then conclude with some questions for our distinguished author. One of the ways I am um, reflecting back uh, Brutal Beauty is by narrating my own experience with it as an artist scholar, as well as a colleague. In my reflections, you will find my questions. The biggest question I might ask uh, today is this. How might I review this book? How might I reasonably reflect its powerful prose? If this were, if I were to simply review Brutal Beauty, I would tell you about the book's mission to reveal, discuss, and explore the perils of neoliberalism, uh, its economies, their havoc that is acted upon the post-colonial city, and the transformation of Bangalore from the Garden City to a Silicon, Silicon Valley twin, also well described by the book's author. I'd go from the well-written introduction outlining scholarly conversations across several fields, urban planning, post-colonial critical theory, and performance studies, to name a few, to the clearly situated historical context in the era of globalization, consciously aware of the extended after effects and shocks of partition and several decades of emergent political turmoil, leading to a conservative government that loves to hear about, about itself. Then I'd lay out the details of each of the five chapters, which thread a multitude of case studies, projects, and artists into a thematic organization, as well as a narrative arc of transformation from a non-binary past to a non-binary present, always complicated, always layered, and always stratified. Whether the subject of the discussion is an artistic expression in sculpture or a performance art, a contemporary impersonation, that definitely is not a simple role play, but a bread earning job, a body of dramatic fiction or documentary work that confess and examine queer sexualities, photographic performances, series that energetically and ironically employ narcissism to, narcissism to empower beyond the limits imposed by the bourgeoisie or a performative generosity through a forest of recycled wires. Brutal beauty weaves ideas, objects, people, theories, and their material presence into an expansive study of a city in motion. The center of the city is its capital, not the capital flows, buildings, architecture, roads, and the objects mapping the streets, but something that capital may not necessarily care about. Humans, non-binary, non-categorized, and unlimited. But also the opposite of all these things. In a review of a book that takes up works of art, I can perhaps enumerate, mention, and co-interpret the work of art that author, this author studiously examines. I can name some of these expressions of life in sequence to provide a flavor of the spirit and tone of the book, but also to take stock of its breadth and scope. The titles are Home, Private Sky, Collateral, Dark Room, Alaeddin, Kolkata Box, John and Jane, Dancing on Glass, Bravely Fought the Queen, Do the Needful, Seven Steps Around the Fire, A Life in Trans Activism, I Am Vidya, A Transgender's Journey, Color of Trans 2.0, Phantom Lady or Kismet, Return of the Phantom Lady. Is it what you think? Hunter Wally, Woman with a Whip, 12 Bed Ward, The Brief Ascension of Marianne Hossein, Behind the Beautiful Whatevers, my hands smell of you. They had their home here, unclaimed and other urban fiction, frictions. Romeo's and Juliet's, an empty bench, let go and keep distance. 
You might consider here that I avoided stating the names of the artists because of my newly onset internalized liberal feel, fear of mispronouncing the names of the artists. Yes, people in the Global South do often mispronounce each other's names, and that's okay. I decided to avoid the panic. In a review of Brutal Beauty, I might so easily turn to an emotional, almost cinematic journey so well embedded from the beginning to the end of the book. Beginning with panic and anxiety set to barely detected soundscapes of urban transformation, on to a disdainfully and sometimes, sometimes gratifyingly performed Western affect to the noise of phones ringing and chatters in a call center. Then a hesitantly and eventually confrontationally manifested queerness against conventions in dramatic plays, rhythmically accounting for the power of language and close reading, quickly intensifying passions in superhero images, inspiring hope, fantasy, and dreams, only to stop suddenly to the sound of silence after the last train. And finally, a grotesque sense of self-loathing, the kind that can only be generated by one's trash, dirt, junk, debris, detritus, and toxic leftovers after the consumption of dreams has taken hold and the promised destination never materialized. Brutal Beauty takes its reader on an emotional journey that can only be constructed by its critical optimism, materialist pessimism, and this optimistic claim that one of the answers to the ills of the neoliberal enterprise may live in our own reformulations of our sense of humanity through understanding aesthetics. Of course, if I were reviewing this book, I would definitely do the aforementioned gloss in order to get to the heart of the matter at hand. The book's project is clear. It says that an often unseen or unwillfully or willfully ignored resource in the transformation of societies is the artist and their aesthetic creations who functions as creator, critic, reference, and inspiration. It also says that neoliberalism itself is an aesthetic project. While the book arrives to this point through a complex argument and description of neoliberalism aesthetic dimensions, it historicizes with intensity and verve a large number of cultural artifacts, sitting them on a pedestal to be seen, witnessed, interpreted, and analyzed. The book clearly navigates through three decades of contemporary artworks, keeping them in a steady and parallel conversation with the cultural history of the city of Bangalore and the longer recent history of India as a transforming nation since partition. Insightfully incisive, Brutal Beauty enters an ongoing conversation without shying away from the taboo subjects of the day. Forget sex, nation, and religion. We're talking about shame, fear, mental illness, and sheer garbage, trash upon trash, toxic waste, toxic waste. Obviously, I am not reviewing this book. The mission today as per the invitation, is to comment on it and perhaps to comment on this work as the outcome of the author's labor. In order to do this, one must get personal. The experience reading this book is similar to the qualities of the book itself, layered and gutsy. Jisha Menon's writing style is indicative of a scholar who is confident in her writing, occasionally showing up in the book when you least expect her to, not only grammatically, but also in person. You may be reading about call centers only to find yourself looking into a corporate environment where she is receiving a badge and walking into the space being discussed. She sits there observing as a good ethnographer might, listening to what is happening and taking notes. Then she proceeds to analyze the discussion with a call center employee. The employee, maybe others, are feeling feelings. Maybe they're thinking, I want to do this right, just as I. I'm trying to do this right. And then you or me, the reader, realize that there's Jisha Menon, the writer, and Jisha Menon, the, the researcher, and Jisha Menon, the person. They are all here on the page multitasking as she does being a professor, mentor, director of centers and schools, scholar, all observing them, observing you, guiding them, guiding you. Understated and thoughtful, 
concise and clear, resolved and flexible, drawing a canvas of intellectual possibilities and opening doors to ways of thinking about the situation and the work. Her entrance to the page is followed by a graceful exit, demonstrating control over her prose, narrating, and communication. The writer's entry and exit in this book is infrequent but powerful and methodical. It reminded me as a reader that we are dealing with a native researcher, not a casual visitor or an international researcher. The book feels like a long durée treatment of ongoing struggles and transformations in Bangalore, the kind that those who know can explain very well. And those who belong in some meaningful way can speak of and about with liberty. Simultaneously, this feeling also indicates that the stakes are unusually high. To historicize a city that one knows so well takes on a new dimension. Memory, memories form unseen foundations of analysis. Invisible events comparatively enter the equation. Complex layers of responsibility cause writer blocks and form bridges, and references to unsighted pasts provide detours. The confidence of the writer in this book clearly comes from knowing beyond the pages. This confidence is both scholarly and native. I can see this in a quirky moment. At one point, Menon discusses the naming of Bangalore and how debates occurred about what happens with the naming, only to impatiently declare, only as a scholar familiar with tired debates might, and I quote, in a rapidly burgeoning city, narratives of the past are as unstable as predictions of the future, period, and she moves on. As a scholar of performance studies, I often paused to reflect on meaningful ideas and questions that I can take with me to my own scholarly pursuits. Um, I'm looking at the time. I think I will stop here, but I will ask a few questions uh, before I go. Uh, and here I ask my colleague, Jisha Menon, how did your own subject position, however you may choose to self-identify, play a role in the research and writing of this book? Can you speak more about performance as a global phenomenon and how performance in the city, in a city like Bangalore, are, is a venue for better understanding urban life and sense of nationhood? Clearly, in the book, I get the sense that you see the artist as conscience. Is my impression reasonable? How might your understanding of the artist's function contributed to readings of the artworks in this book? Thank you so much for writing this book. And uh, I really do think it's a great gift to our field. Great. Thank you so much. That's extraordinary. Both Samar and Usha, I feel overwhelmed and humbled and honored by everything that you've had to say. And you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that the book lives up to the incredible description that you've just offered about it. But thank you so much for thinking with me and offering such, uh, you know, sort of very thoughtful and insightful provocations. There's so much um, here for me to think with and. Um, uh, dwell on. And I think maybe we, you know, just to sort of think about one uh, question that came up or uh, an insight that both of you sort of draw on is the, is the, uh, the writing of um, artworks and aesthetics and how that's related to the material or, you know, or how is it in relation to uh, the city itself. And I think that that's a, a question that I grappled with um, because I do want to think about the aesthetic as not as something that's bracketed off from, um, you know, from the city life, uh, from material formations. I think it's important to kind of um, not re-insulate art as if it was some special kind of commodity that exists outside of the currents of history and politics, uh, but to really think about it also as a kind of material formation, um, having its own kind of um, 
you know, production history, its power effects, its social relations, and how does it sort of speak to and within the uh, very material context of the city. And, um, you know, I think that, Usha, when you sort of um, uh, invoked Sylvia Winter, I think very much that it's um, important for us to think about in these situations, not only what beauty is, but what beauty does, right? Like, so not just what is aesthetics, but what is aesthetics doing? And I think that's a kind of shift that I'm trying to make in this book, is to think about the kinds of um, violences that are enabled by this kind of self-evident category of beauty that is circulating in a way that uh, is treated as if you know you don't need to unpack what that means, but it can be invoked um, as a legitimating kind of um, norm that can then uh, allow certain things to be done. So uh, it's a question that's close to the scholars of performance studies is to sort of move from questions of ontology to epistemology and think about what is, uh, how does something work as means rather than as an object? So part of what the effort here was to look at a category like beauty and rather than try to define it or say, this is beauty, to think about what are its effects, what is this discourse enabling? Um, and I've always been very influenced by the work of uh, Gurman Williams, the, you know, the prominent socialist British uh, critic who has often reminded us that culture is ordinary, that we should continue to look at um, culture not as these kind of isolated artistic monuments, but as this kind of material formation. So I think that that uh, is also uh, an, uh, an ethic and sensibility that runs throughout the book. Um, and I also to sort of return to the question of critique and love, which I think is a beautiful question. And I'm so glad that we get this question because I do think that especially, um, you know, scholars in South Asia writing today, when we are critical of our uh, governments, we can, be branded as anti-national, which is, um, you know, nothing could be further from the truth because I think we're being patriotic when we point out our criticisms of uh, the country. So I think that there's a deep imbrication uh, in ideas of love and critique. And this is why I think someone like uh, Chekhov becomes a great person to think with, you know, even when you're uh, launching your critique of urban transformations and how that's impacted um, material lives on the ground. I think it's uh, valuable to go to someone like Chekhov who's both very cheeky in his characterizations. Um, you know, there's always a certain kind of warmth in the way that he portrays his characters and the subjects, but also a kind of mocking tone. So there's always a kind of um, irony or um, uh, some kind of critique that's woven into um, his warmth. So I think that that is, a, was a useful way for me to enter into some of these debates is to hold on to both a sense of care and as well as a sense of responsibility, which is kind of where I think the artists are coming from as well. So Samar, when you say that these artists are sort of the conscience of uh, the city, I think that there's something to that. I think it's very beautifully put. But uh, the, the effort really is to think of, uh, again, artists and artworks not as autonomous or outside of, but very much enmeshed in as porous, as layered as uh, you were saying, Samar. Because again, they are, you know, responding to the transformations that they're living in. So a lot of their works are critical. Uh, but there's all, also, you know, there's, they're incredibly powerful and they are affected. They, uh, you know, they affect you quite literally when you're standing in front of them. And so again, this notion of love, I think, is, uh, is both, a, you know, a way of evincing attention. How do you pay attention to something? I think is a way of thinking about what you mean by love. I do love what uh, Anna also said, which is, you know, justice is what love looks like in public. I think that's brilliant. Um, but these 
artists are also saying, you know, in addition to just kind of thinking about critique, how do you stand in the presence of something and pay attention to it? Because that can be a form of, of love as well. And I do think that the, the kind of porous ways in which um, city and citizen arts and artists, as well as the kind of social uh, transformations that they're trying to capture in their artworks are trying to get at some of uh, what it means to be both receptive to these urban transformations as well as take responsibility for it, right? So that's a dynamic that I think the art artists and the artworks are kind of manifesting, this dialectic of receptivity and responsibility in that this is no longer some of those older questions of autonomy and instrumentality that we confront a lot when we're writing about um, artists with an ear for social justice. It's not just that, you know, uh, this is art that's not as good because they're like responding to their political realities or there's an instrumentalism in this work. These are artists who are profoundly moved, affected by, and are responsive and responding to the urban transformation. So I think there's uh, really an incredible amount of um, uh, ideas and thoughts in all of your, uh, in your comments. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, there's a lot more that I could go on, but maybe as a, as a starting point, as some sort of um, way to begin to respond to your very generous provocations. And all of that is actually provoked by the generosity of the book's observations. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so maybe we could go to the Q&A and um, I could read out a question. Um, Vidu S says, um, would you reiterate your quote about narcissism and, and the continual presentation of self on social media? Though specifically about Bangalore, your book applies so much to life here in the US and other global cities too. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the question of narcissism was really interesting to me because, of course, we are living in this moment of quite heightened narcissism when we are you know, constantly curating ourselves, our personalities on social media, on Twitter, etc. Um, so I think one of the things that I was interested in thinking about is how uh, we can think about narcissism in ways that may return to some of the earlier versions of it. Uh, Freud, for instance, thinks about narcissism as this kind of oceanic uh, feeling that um, disperses the self into the sociality so that you're not this kind of bounded, self-absorbed, insulated subject. There's a way in which you are libidinally dispersed. And I think with Pushpamala's work, Pushpamala is an artist from Bangalore, um, and she does um, performance art and she's also a sculptor uh, and performance photography and in it she's uh, the subject of her own artworks and you know many feminist artists have been criticized for being narcissistic in ways that they are using their own bodies as artworks. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to move beyond the notion of narcissism as uh, self-absorption and think about the extent to which um, it could also um, be a way to evince a kind of uh, love and um, care for the city. So, um, so I, I guess we're out of time. So I just wanted to say, I would invite you to read the book. Uh, it does more than that as well, because I go into Marpisa and the way in which he is urging us to move beyond um, genital conceptions of sexuality to thinking about more um, dispersed accounts of libidinal encounters with environments. But I'll stop there as we are out of time. Thank you all so much for this rich engagement with this excellent piece of work. It's really a privilege and an honor to have hosted um, our lunch hour together. And um, I wish we were lunching in person and talking over a good cup of tea, but that will have to wait for slightly future times. Um, so anticipating a less precarious future for us all and hoping everybody stays well and happy and healthy. Uh, 
if you want to hear more about Jisha's book, you can also check out her conversation with our Associate Director Lalita Duperon on the SAS pod. So that is um, a, an excellent way to, to learn more. And of course, you can acquire the book, the link to it at Northwestern University Press is in the chat. Um, so thank you to everybody for joining us. Well, thank you especially to Jisha and also, of course, to Usha and Samar for your time and uh, this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for hosting this event, Anna, Lalita, Sindhu. Thank you so much. And Samar and Usha, thank you so much for being discussing. <laughs>